for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thanksgiving weekend teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is Friday afternoon meeting. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker. The uh, first teaching I ever heard on deliverance or anything about deliverance was a tape that was Norman Parrish, and I don't think you knew when it was made that it was being made, did you? And uh, that tape in the 60s, in the middle 60s and late 60s, I think went all over the country, everywhere. And uh, that was our beginning of ever hearing anything on tape of deliverance. And then it was several years, many years after that, before we ever met Brother Parrish and his wife Betty. And then since we met them, first met them, why we've had the pleasure of supporting them and having him come here from time to time to minister. And uh, even though the Lord has given him an understanding of deliverance. He's going to teach on deliverance this afternoon. But he doesn't, uh, that really isn't his calling. Even though God has given him the understanding and the revelation, that's just part of his calling. God's calling on Brother Parrish really is the founding of the gospel of the Lord Jesus through Central and South America, publishing it to the unsaved and to the uh, uh, raising up churches through all Central and South America. I see those of you who are here and heard him last night uh, give that testimony of what happened to a, uh, from a deliverance session and the great church that God raised up because of Well, that's just one of them. There are hundreds of them in Central and South America because of the ministry of the parish family. And it's a privilege to have them come and minister here this afternoon. Brother Norman. Well, praise the Lord. So it's always a joy to come back to Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. We're only sorry that on this occasion we can only be here for two days, yesterday and today. We have to leave tomorrow morning for Dallas, Texas, and we're going to be over the weekend and then leave for Guatemala, fly directly from Dallas to Guatemala City Monday. So uh, it's a very short stay. We would love to have been able to attend the whole camp meeting, and uh, because we always enjoy God's presence in this place. It's such a delight to meet so many Christians from so many different places. Okay, let's get into the Word this afternoon, and we're going to study what the Bible says about the occult. Now, it would be impossible in an hour and a half or two hours to speak about, what every, about everything that the Bible has to say about the occult. Impossible. Uh, from Genesis through Revelation, you'll find a lot of teaching on the magical arts, the occult sciences, the psychic powers that abound in the world today. How many know that Satanism is, is on the rise? Uh, I believe when Jesus said in Matthew 24 that in the end times iniquity would abound, and because of that the love of many would grow cold, I believe he was referring to a large extent, to the occult. Uh, as Satanism and all its, uh, uh, all the rituals and practices that go along with it abounds, increases, it's going to affect the spiritual life of most Christians. And we see that happening today. Uh, through the media, especially through television, Christians are being bombarded with all kinds of occult implications. Uh, cartoons are full of the occult. Sitcoms are full of the occult. It's, we're, we're being, you know, just uh, absolutely <laughs> infested by all these ideas in, in a very, very crafty or a very cunning way. Uh, we're not even aware of what's happening. And yet, these things are 
being impressed on our mind and soul to the point that many Christians are succumbing to it. So we need to study these things so that we can be on our guard. The Bible says we must be sober, we must be vigilant, we must be fully alert to the dangers that the church of Jesus Christ is facing in the end time. I believe, brethren, that the greatest battle in the end times will not be with communism or socialism, it will be with spiritualism. Spiritualism is the main enemy of the church. The Satanists have a, a goal in mind. They are out to conquer the world. And I believe that what has been called the Antichrist will be a man that will be will have a power not his own. That's what Daniel says in chapter 7 and 8. A power not his own. A great power that he will use to attack the church. The Bible says that he will make war on the saints and that he will prevail and that he will overcome. Now what is he going to use to bring Christians to their knees in defeat? He's going to use his occult powers. And the attack is going to be in the spiritual realm. I don't believe that uh, Christians will go through the horrors of the Middle Age. I don't know if Christians are going to be burned at the stake or they're going to be beheaded literally with uh, guillotines or that we're going to be shot. Uh, maybe those days are over because of the emphasis today on uh, individual freedoms and civil rights. Perhaps these things cannot happen, but I believe the attack is going to be in the spirit realm against the church. And many Christians are going to be victimized. Many Christians are going to face sickness and poverty and divorce and other things that have been provoked through an occult attack directly on them or on their families. So let's get into the Word and see what the Bible has to say about these things. We're going to start in Acts chapter 8. It's a well-known story. It's the story of Philip, the ministry, Philip's ministry in the city of Samaria. As you know, Samaria was a city that was populated by people that were half-breeds. They were half-Jewish and half-Gentile. Uh, they were people that uh, had a, a, a religion that was not entirely faithful to God, the God of Israel. They had incorporated certain pagan beliefs and, and practices. Uh, it was a syncretism of paganism and Judaism. And so when Philip went down to Samaria, he was first to leave Jerusalem, to flee Jerusalem in the first great persecution against the Christian church. He went down to Samaria, the minister, to, uh, he discovered that there was a man in town, and his name was Simon, who had tremendous influence and control over the people of Samaria. Now, who was Simon? As we read uh, Acts chapter 8, we discover in verse 9 that he was a sorcerer. That means that this man had occult powers. He knew how to use them and direct them against people. The Bible says here in Acts chapter 8, verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Now this is the mark of a false prophet. A false prophet will always boost himself. will always... Uh, promote his own interests, will toot his own horn, will try to draw attention to himself. He'll try to impress people with his uh, powers and accomplishments. The Bible says that he that seeks his own glory is not of God. Uh, a true prophet will always seek the glory of him that sent him. Uh, will always seek the glory of God. Will seek to glorify God through his words and through his deeds. But a false prophet will always try to draw attention to himself. He's seeking man's admiration. He's seeking man's applause. And we see this in the body of Christ today, especially with some of the big names, uh, ministries. Uh, they're, 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 you know, uh, promoting their own cause to the extent that uh, Jesus Christ uh, has passed to a second or third uh, place of importance. I remember a few years ago, I got a magazine, one of the best-known evangelists here in America, and uh, I began to read through it, and I, I, just out of curiosity, I decided to mark the number of times that his name appeared in this magazine, 
and the number of times that the name of Jesus Christ appeared in this magnet magazine. And who do you think won? Uh, eight to one. His name appeared eight times for every reference that was made to the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder some of these ministries are falling uh, into disgrace, into defeat, because uh, they are, some of them are showing the marks of the of false ministries. It says here he was given out himself that he was some great one. You know, the people of Samaria were so deceived and thinking this man was the great power of God. They didn't think he was the power of the devil. He was thinking, they were thinking he was the power of God. That the power of God was manifesting in and through him. But what was he doing? He was directing his powers, his occult powers, against the people of Samaria. The people of Samaria trusted him, and he betrayed their trust, because he was putting them under a spell, under a hex. No wonder that there were so many people that were sick and afflicted in that city. The Bible says that when, when Philip began to minister in the power of the Spirit of God, the miracle power of, of God began to manifest in behalf of the people of Samaria, in behalf of those that repented and believed. In verse 7 it says, For unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed of them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. You notice that? Many people in Samaria, from the least to the oldest, many people, young and old, were affected by evil spirits. Some were affected emotionally, some were affected physically, but there were many people in that town that were under a curse, brought upon because of their involvement in the occult. They were followers of Simon the Magician. Now here we see the story of a whole city that was mesmerized by one man. And that shows us, brethren, that the occult is not something to be puhooed. It's not something to be laughed at. It's not something to be scoffed. Because there are real powers working in and behind the occult. Amen? There are five powers that we ought not fear, but we ought to respect. I don't think you should fear the devil, but I think he, <laughs> you need to respect him. Even in his present state. Uh, if you found a dog lying out on the highway that had been run under by a car, and you noticed that that dog was foaming at the mouth, you suspect immediately that dog had what? Rabies. Rabies. Would you run over to him and begin to pet him? Uh, that dog was injured. He was probably at this door, and, and he would bite at you and inject his deadly poison in your bloodstream. I mean, he's more dangerous in that condition than he is just running around because he's hurt. Amen? If you saw a rattlesnake lying around there that also had been, and he was writhing there in agony, would you pick that rattlesnake up and would you begin to play with it? No, you know that he's dangerous because he's hurt. And he could sink his fangs into your body and inject that deadly poison that could either uh, make you sick or kill you at once. Amen? Now, we know that Satan was defeated at the, on the cross. Isn't that true? The Bible says that he was stripped, that he was shamed, that he was defeated, that he was destroyed. We can't go into that right uh, at this moment. But we know that though he is in that condition, he is still dangerous. And he can do it with you. He can do a great deal of damage wherever there is ignorance, wherever there is rebellion, wherever there is unbelief. Wherever he can find a fertile ground, he will do as much damage as he can, especially knowing that his time is short. The Bible says the devil has come down on you to the earth plane, knowing with great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And today, more than ever before, the enemy is on a rampage, and especially against the body of Christ. Because if, if you want to know the truth, the only institution, if we want to call that an organism, that is standing in the way, that is barring the way to the ultimate triumph of evil in the world, is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The true church, born again, spirit-filled. The devil knows that, so now he's trying to discredit the church. 
And sometimes we 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 help him. Huh? We help him by uh, spreading ugly rumors about certain ministers. Um, unsubstantiated. We have to be very careful what we do. Because we can be aiding and abetting the enemy. Uh, and that would be a traitorous act. So we have to ask for wisdom. We need to discern. We need to let the Spirit of God guide us in, in what we should say and what we should do in that respect. Okay, here we find an entire city that was in bondage to Satan because of the intervention of one man, Simon, the sorcerer. Hundreds were be, bewitched. Hundreds were possessed. And so when Philip came to town, he had a extraordinary ministry as people were released from all these oppressions and from all these illnesses that were of satanic nature. Now, Philip was a great man. He was a humble man, but a great man. And most great men are humble. <laughs> uh, that's the mark of greatness. But uh, he had his deficiencies. He had his limitations. And one thing we're going to find out if we read the story in depth is that Philip lacked a gift called discerning of spirits. He had the gift of miracle, the working of miracles. He had the gift of, uh, of healings, etc., etc., but he, the gift of discerning of spirits was sadly lacking in his life. Why? Because Phil, I mean, Simon was able to deceive him. Now, you've heard a saying that is very popular in America. If you can't beat them, what? Join. So what did Phil, uh, Simon do? He decided to join the church. So he went through the motions. He made a profession, a pretense. Uh, he supposedly was saved, and as a result of that, he was baptized in water. But was he a true convert? Absolutely not. God, in his mercy, sent Peter and John, two of the great apostles. He sent them to Samaria to investigate what was happening. They came to find out for sure if it was God that was moving in that city or not. And when they came down, they ministered the Holy Ghost to the congregation, to perhaps hundreds or the people that had been saved and baptized, so they were ready to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And as Peter and John, by the laying on of hands, ministered the Spirit to them, uh, Simon was present. He was, he was just flabbergasted to see what was happening. There must have been some kind of physical manifestations, because he saw that by the laying of hands the Spirit was given. So he, he offered Peter and, and John money. He said, Give me this power. I want to have that same ability. I want to be able to lay hands on people so that they can receive the Holy Spirit of God. And immediately, Peter, who had discerning of spirits, began to denounce that man. We can see it in verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money's perish with thee. What he was saying is, You're going to perish, and your money's going to perish with you. He was not a saved man. He was condemned. He was on his road to perdition. Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. He was an outsider that had infiltrated the church. Uh, he had been planted there. The enemy had brought him in to try to discredit and disrupt the body of Christ. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. He had never repented of his occult involvement. And the only way, brethren, that you can be released from all the evil influences that have entered your life by being involved in the occult, uh, through the horoscope or through the Ouija board and through all these other things that are so popular today as games, as pastime, is by repenting. And repenting is a gift of God. God gave them repentance unto life. It's not easy to repent. You can moan and cry and still not repent. Sorrow itself is not repentance. There can be the kind of sorrow that leads to repentance is godly sorrow. And it's a sorrow that is created by the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now notice this, for I perceive. That was an introspective look. Uh, Peter could look right into Simon, 
And he said, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He was imprisoned by evil spirit. And he was full of bitterness. And why was he bitter? Because he lost his prestige and he lost his clientele. His juicy business went down the drain when Philip came to town. He lost all his customers. He had to close his witchcraft center down. And that's why he was bitter. So what we see here, brethren, is one of the main tactics Satan uses today to destroy the influence, the unity of the body of Christ. And what is that? Infiltration. And we're going to talk about infiltration this afternoon. Because as I've traveled over the United States uh, these last eight, nine weeks, I've found several churches that have been infiltrated by those that are involved in the occult. Just three weeks ago, I was in Pennsylvania in a church in the, near Philadelphia that has, was nearly devastated by the experience. In fact, the pastor, the former pastor, left town just two days before I got there. He hastily turned the church over to his assistant pastor and, and left town. Why? Because the Spirit showed me there were three women in that church that were involved in the occult. In fact, they were in the meeting the night I was there. I was there Halloween night. And uh, there was a lady sitting over here to this side, dressed in black. And there were two. Uh, there was a lady beside her and a lady behind her. And the Lord showed me that the three were witches. In fact, the Lord showed me that the woman, the lady in black, was in a lesbian relationship with the one that was sitting beside her. And these women had started attending the church maybe three or four months ago. And when they came to uh, came to the church, the oppression got so heavy, so thick that the pastor resigned and left. In fact, uh, there were certain rumors of certain uh, uh, shenanigans that were going on in church. I mean, no one would accuse the pastor of falling, falling into immorality, but there were some rumors that were floating through the air. These women had brought in the oppression, and they had been praying against the pastor to the point that he just couldn't stand the, you know, the spiritual atmosphere that had developed, and he decided to resign and leave. When I came into the church, the afternoon I arrived there, I could sense something wrong in, in, in the building. Now, the pastor, the interim pastor, or the, the man that took the church over, uh, he didn't inform me of anything. He kept it hush-hush. Well, after I preached the message, he and several of the elders came up to me and they, they said, Brother Parrish, your message was prophetic. The Lord showed you what was going on in this book. And you put the finger right on it. Huh? See, many churches in America are being infiltrated. Satan is planting his minions in the church. And these people, particularly women, sad to say, are being used by the devil to... Try to bring the church to its knees. Amen? We're going to see about that. Anyways, we're, as we study the occult this afternoon, we have to, we must realize that the occult is strictly forbidden by God in His Word. Amen? Because when you get involved in the occult, you are consorting with God's enemy, the devil. Amen? You're consorting with the enemy. And because of that, you come under judgment. And there are many consequences of being involved directly or indirectly in the occult. For let's read two or three of these consequences right now. Leviticus chapter 19. If anyone here this afternoon has been involved in the occult, uh, you must repent of your wrongdoing. Uh, because the only thing that will cancel out the judgment upon you and upon your descendants is repentance. The Bible says in, in uh, James chapter 2, verse 13, I think it is, says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen? Mercy triumphs over judgment. So when you want, when you come to the realization that you've been involved in something that is strictly forbidden by the Word of God, the only way that you're going to be able to cancel out the judgment that's already pending upon you and upon your family is by appealing to God's mercy. 
Have you read in the Gospels how often people that were demonized or sick would come to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy, have mercy on me. When they cried out for mercy, what were they doing? They were asking God, they were appealing to God's mercy in order to cancel out the judgment that was upon them due to their sin, whatever that sin might have been. Amen? For example, the father of demonized boy, the one, the lunatic, the boy that had these uh, epileptic seizures, he said, Lord, do something, have mercy on us. You know, he knew that this boy was afflicted not because of his own sins, but of the sins of his ancestors, the sins of his forefathers. That the, the, the sin of his, his uh, the father or the grandfather, great grandfather, had opened the door to demonic activity in that boy's life. Okay, now let's look what uh, here in Leviticus chapter 19, and we're going to read verse 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. What does the occult do to the, a Christian, or to any human being for that matter. It defiles. Amen? It defiles. And the word defilement has there to do with demon infestation. When you get involved in the occult fortune telling, a magic, or anything else, you're going to be defiled by evil spirits. You're opening yourself up to demonic activity. And the demons will enter and defile your spirit, and you'll be seriously affected by it. Leviticus 26, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-warring, a-whoring after them, I will set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. The word says here that when you consult with people that are involved in the occult, rich wizards or warlocks, you are going a whoring after Satan. That's called spiritual adultery. Amen? And what does the Bible say? Adulterers and adulteresses know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. By getting involved in your cult, you are becoming God's enemy. By consorting with God's enemy, you become God's enemy. And God will turn against you and will destroy the works of your hands. And you will be under judgment and your family, at least to the third and fourth generation. So the new thing you need to do if you've ever been involved is definitely to, uh, to repent. Ask God for repentance. Because that's the only way that you'll be delivered from the consequences of your involvement in your cult. Let's now go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 44. Here's one of the consequences of your involvement in the occult. Isaiah 44, 25. Verse 24, the Bible, God says, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by its, in myself, that frustrate, frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and makes, maketh diviners mad. Diviners mad. Mental illness is a consequence of any past involvement in the occult. I've been to certain areas of America, especially, let's say, New York, the Mohawk, Mohawk Valley, where there's a tremendous amount of mental illness. And if you investigate, you'll find that Around the turn of the century, many, many people living in that area got involved in the occult. Spiritualism was, was very popular back then. They would have these spiritualist sessions, what we call seances. And people would come and there would be the table tipping and all that psychic phenomena. And today they're reaping the consequences because there's uh, numerous individuals in that area that are now emotionally and mentally sick. The Bible says here that God makes the divinators or the diviners mad. Amen? See, it's no, it, the occult is not, not something you just play with. Amen? Dungeons and dragons can drive people mad. Amen. It's a game, so they say. 
now they have it on video, and they have it on, I think, in some of these uh, Nintendo games. You, you can buy uh, some cassettes. Uh, you can see the game, so, so they call it, on your television uh, monitor. But any involvement in the occult, even through the horoscope or through the Ouija board, can lead to mental illness. And it can be diagnosed, but it cannot be cured by medical doctors. Now let's go to Isaiah 47, and we're going to find other consequences of being involved in the occult. And this should be serve as a warning to us. And we should make this known to our friends and our relatives. Isaiah 47, 9. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and widowhood. Uh, you can lose, lose your husband, you can lose your children. You'd be left alone. Now, the loss of husband and loss of children could be through death, but it also could be through divorce. Amen? The Bible says this. Why? They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. See? Death of your loved ones, your husband, your children, can be the consequence of your involvement in the occult. So be wary, wary, or be careful, because, brethren, this is not something to be taken lightly. Now, I don't know if you've not noticed, but most people that are involved in what we call the women's liberation movement are involved in the occult. And most people that are involved in the gay and lesbian rights movement are also involved in the occult. How many know that humanism and spiritualism go hand in hand? They're like Siamese twins. They're inseparable. You go to a New Age bookstore anywhere in America today, and you'll find that at least half the titles have to do with the occult. Amen? See, that's the religion of the New Agers is Satanism. Most New Agers are involved somewhere or another in satanic beliefs and practice. So you have to be extremely careful, because some of that's getting into the church. Amen? Why? Let's go to First Chronicles 10.13. Why do you think that Saul died, died such a tragic death? You know, he, he killed himself. But it says here in First Corinthians 10.13, So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the will of the Lord, which, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. And inquire not of the Lord, therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom on to David, the son of Jesse. See? The Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of what? Witchcraft. And most people that are involved in their cult are involved in their cult because they have rebelled against God. They will not submit to God's laws. You know, they're very opinionated people. They're very willful people. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to be under anybody's restraints. They won't submit to God or to God's delegated authority on earth. That's our only safety, if you want to know. Amen? Amen. We need to be under sound leadership. I, I find a lot of Christians today that are not connected with any church or any group. They're, they're just out there by themselves. And they're easy prey to all the wolves that are out there in the, in the forest. Now, I always counsel people. You know, they say, Brother, in my, the area where I live, there's no church that believes in deliverance. I said, well, you find some church, the best church, and, and become part of it even though they don't believe in deliverance. Huh? You must belong to something. Be accountable. And be under the protection of a, of a church body, even though they might not believe what you believe exactly. And you are going to have to ask for guidance and prudence so that you will know how to live the Christian life before them and not try to ram the deliverance doctrine down their throat, because that would be counterproductive. Amen? But you must belong to some local church. And you must be under leadership. You must be under spiritual authority. And that will be your protection against the wiles of the enemy. You know that the ultimate consequences of our involvement in the occult can be found here in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, 8. Chapter 21, 8. 
But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. 22.15 For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. See, by being involved with cult, you are excluded from the New Jerusalem. And you are headed for the lake of fire and brimstone. Isn't that a sad, a sad, uh, how would you say, destiny? Huh? To be excluded from the kingdom of God and to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So, brethren, we should avoid the occult like a plague. Don't even read the horoscope. Because you'll become contaminated. In fact, if you're looking at a television program, where there are a lot of, you know, things that are cultic in nature, it would be best to switch channels or it would be best to turn the set off. Amen. Amen? Because it's going to affect you. Somewhere or another, it's going to affect you. Now, some people think that the occult is, you know, just a laughing matter. But I'll tell you by my own experience, by the experience of hundreds of people that I minister to, I can assure you that the occult is nothing to be played with. We must avoid it like the plague. Now, we're going to look at several verses that will show us how the occult can influence individuals and families and cities and nations. Let's turn to Acts uh, chapter 13. You remember that Paul was released for ministry around the known world. He had been a prophet. He had been a teacher. But now the Lord calls him into an apostolic ministry. And the Bible says that he sent... By the Holy Spirit, he embarked in his first missionary journey. And one of the first places he came to was an island called Cyprus, just off the coast of what is called today Lebanon or Syria. There in the, middle, uh, in the Mediterranean, there's an island called Cyprus. And the Bible says here in Acts chapter 13 that when he got to the island, he crossed the island from east to west, and he came to the capital city, which was called Paphos. Amen. And there, he came in contact with a man that was involved in the cult. His name was Bar-Jesus, or Elimus. And what was he? A sorcerer, a false prophet. Amen? You know, Brother, uh, oh, Lord, escapes me right now. Brother Cook, this morning, talked about the dragon and the tail and about the stars of heaven falling. Uh he read uh, Isaiah 9.15, where it talks about that the tale is the prophet that speaketh lies. The tale is a false prophet. That passage can come to prove that in the end times, Satan, through the occult science, is going to attack God's people, especially those that are in prominence, and is going to bring them down to defeat. Amen? Because the false prophet is the tale. And Satan, with his tale, with the occult, but those that are involved in the cult is going to draw a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the ground and stomp upon them. Amen? So the opposition for the body of Christ is going to come from those that are involved in the cult. And here we see a case. Paul came to that city and began to witness to the governor or the deputy of that country. His name was Sergius Paulus. But the, as Paul was trying to minister the word, there was Bar Jesus, or Elimus, resisting him. Probably he was working his witchcraft, trying to, uh, you know, uh, get Paul all confused, get Paul all uh, befuddled so that he would, could be able to give a clear and convincing testimony to this man. And what did Paul do? Verse 9 Then Paul, who was also called Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you, in order to overcome the enemy, you're going to have to be what? Filled with the Holy Ghost. This is something that we must renew daily, is the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's not a once-for-all occurrence. The initial infilling is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in order to live in victory over Satan and over every satanic attack, you're going to have to keep yourself filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing process. Filled with the Holy Ghost set his eyes on him and said, Oh, full of all subtlety, subtlety, and all mischief. 
That word full there is the same word in Acts 2 4 when it says that when the Holy Spirit came upon the, those that were gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This man was full of what? Of the devil. Subtlety and mischief. Thou child of the devil. That's what a, a sorcerer is. That's what anyone that is involved in the cult is a child of the devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness. Will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? See, he was opposing Paul's ministry, trying to keep this man off balance, trying to keep the soldiers Paulus from understanding, from believing the truth. And so Paul had to pronounce judgment on this man. And by the power of God, this man was blinded. Remember, he had to be taken by the hand. Uh, dark darkness came upon him for a season. It was temporary. But the important thing is here we see the victory of Paul assisted by the Holy Spirit over this man called Elimus that was assisted by an evil spirit. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. See, witchcraft can be directed against an individual. It was being directed here against Sergius Paulus and at the same against Saul, the apostle, trying to keep this man, this key man in that city, in that island, from coming into the knowledge of the truth. And it was only through the power of the Holy Spirit that Paul was able to overcome. And that's the only way we are going to be able to overcome. Now, Satan's power can be directed against families. Let's go to the book of Nahum, the Old Testament. It's kind of warm in here this afternoon, or am I the only one? And that when when it gets this warm, people get sleepy. And I'm seeing some of you with glazed eyes. I don't know if you're sleepy or drugged, one of the two things. I don't know if you took some pills or today, but it's really hard to concentrate when it's uh, so warm. But let's look at Nahum chapter 3, verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the world-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft, notice that, the mistress of witchcraft, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Now, who was he talking about here? The prophet, Nim. He wasn't talking about a, a person. He, he was talking about a city. And you know what the city was called? It's right there in chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of Nineveh. Huh? He was talking about Nineveh. Nineveh was a city that was immersed in the occult. Why do you think God sent John, John, Jonah to Nineveh to pronounce judgment upon that city. What was Jonah's message? Within 40 days, Nineveh is going to be wiped out. Totally destroyed. Men, women, boys and girls, everybody. Judgment is, is coming. Why? Because the city was involved in what? In the occult. And they sold families and they sold nations through their occult. No wonder Jonah was afraid to go there. He he knew her, what kind of reputation that city had. He said, if I go there, they're going to put a curse on me. Would you go somewhere where you knew that there were some very powerful witches working against you? Huh? That could direct their occult powers and cause uh, all kinds of mental and physical problems? I doubt if you would go there. Uh, it's no wonder Jonah wanted to go in the opposite direction. He was willing to pay his boat fare. Get as far away from any of us possible. Because God turned him around and sent him back. And when he came to Nineveh and preached that message of judgment, and I mean there was there seemed to be no escape because it didn't say if you don't repent, if you don't believe, if you don't surrender, you're going to die. No. What happened? He just said, within 40 days, this city's going to be obliterated from the face of the earth. And the king and all the people of Nineveh repented. And what did they repent of? Of their witchcraft. Amen? And that was the only thing that spared them from death and destruction. Amen? So we hear a city that, using witchcraft, was taking, I mean, what would we say Authority, control over families, over nations. Whole families can be affected through witchcraft. Let me tell you what happened in our family. And I'm 
1974, my dad, who was a missionary, passed away, February. Well, three or four months later, about the May, month of May, or month of June, my mother, who was still living in the family home, called me and she said, Son, I want you to pray for me. I feel awful. And this really surprised me because she had never asked me to pray for her. I mean, we were Baptists. We had, came from a Baptist background. And when we came into the Baptist Holy Spirit, she never felt she needed it. My, my mother's attitude it was, oh, you know, that's all right for others, but I don't need it. I'm, I'm all right as I am. And she never, never received the influence of the Holy Spirit, even to the hour of her death. So uh, when I came into the Baptist of the Holy Spirit in 1962, 1963, she was kind of standoffish. She wouldn't fight it. She wouldn't oppose it openly, but she didn't go along with it either. You know? So when she said, son, I want you to pray for me, I was taken back. You know? And I said, mother, I, I can't come, I can't pray for you today, but uh, tomorrow I'll come and minister to you. And I said, it might be good for you to fast tomorrow, and when I come, you know, you'll be ready for, for ministry. So the next day I showed up and I uh, began to pray for her, and as I began to pray for her, she just uh, lost consciousness. I mean, she went into a trance-like state, and another voice began to speak to her. How oh, what a shocker. <laughs> My mother, a missionary all her life, had evil spirits. How would you like that? Well, anyways, uh, this voice began to say, you're not going to get me out of here. I've been here a long time. I've been here 30 years. And I'm getting ready to, to just bring it, you know, wrap the whole thing up, to bring it to an end. And I said, who are you? And the voice said, I am primitiva. Now, the word primitiva is the Spanish word for the word primitive. Primitiva, primitiva. I said, who, who was primitiva? Oh, primitiva. Then I remembered. See, we lived in the city of Medellin, Colombia. How many have heard of Medellin? The Medellin cartel, the cocaine capital of the world today. Huh? Well, it, when we moved to Medellin in 1938, it was the most fanatic Catholic city in Latin America. It was called Little Rome. In fact, the Pope during the Second World War was thinking of moving either to Quebec in Canada or to Medellin in Colombia if it was necessary. I mean, if, if the war... Uh, forced them out of uh, the Vatican, out of Rome. Now, he was um, Catholic to the core, but, strange to say, most Catholics were involved in the cult. In Latin America, I would say three-fourths of all Catholics are involved somewhere or another in the cult. Well, this woman, Primitiva, uh, let me tell you who she was. She was a sorcerer. She was a witch. M my, our family lived in Medellin from 38 to about 42, rainy. And it was hard to rent then, because when they knew you were a Protestant and that you were planning to have services in your home, sure, they closed the door. In fact, we lived in certain areas of Medellin where they wouldn't even sell us a pound of sugar. My dad had to go downtown to the central market every day where he was not known in order to shop for groceries. Well, there was a new subdivision that was opening up, and my dad decided to buy a piece of land. I mean, he had the scrounge to do it. I don't have the time to tell you what we had to go through in order to buy that property and build that, that home and church. I mean, we were sacrificed. Uh, I didn't have even underwear for several years. <laughs> I didn't even use socks. In fact, one, I remember having one pair of pants, a white pair of pants, when I was about 12, 13, 14 years of age. And when I would come home, my mother would, would make me get into something else, and she'd wash those pants so I could go back to school the next day without any socks or without any underwear. I mean, my dad, every penny he got was to put into that building. Well, he bought this property, and we noticed that another lady bought property next door, and she was huge. She must have weighed about 300, 350 pounds. And she had a disease called elephantitis. Her legs were about this. Well, we, when she built her house, and she built a lovely house, we noticed that cars would drive up, people would get out, out of the cars, well-dressed, and go in and spend a half an hour, an hour with her, and then they'd leave. And every day was different cars, and we begin to think, what's going on there? Well, upon investigation, we found out that she was a fortune teller. People would get, come to get their hands bread, their tea leaves, and 
I mean, she was involved in the cult. Well, my parents knew nothing of the cult. I mean, we're Baptists. You know, my dad had gone to Bible college in Canada, and they had never taught anything on, on the demonic, much less on the cult. This lady was very kind. She befriended my mother, and they were became pretty pals, palsy wildsy, you know. And she would send over cookies, and she would send over things, you know. She would, but you know, the lady hated the gospel, and somehow or another, she put a spell on the whole family, put a curse on us. My mother, about that time, came down ill. And from that day till just before her death, she just had a serious, she was a psycho. So, so we thought. We just didn't pay much attention to her sickness. Because she was always, it was either the, lid, the, the kidneys or the liver or the heart or the lungs or something. She had some malady. It was one thing after the other. My sister, my oldest sister who lives in Toronto, Canada, has had since then two open heart surgeries. And she's very, very sickly. Well, the curse was put on the whole back. I remember, you know, my dad had a call, God, to the mission people, especially to Columbia. But after we moved to that new location, my dad began to get, you know, anxious and desperate. And he wasn't happy there anymore. He, I, I noticed that he was just in, in uh, you know, kind of like an uproar. So about 1965, he made a trip through Central America investigating these small Central American countries to see where the family could move. In 1946, the whole family went through Central America on our way to the States and Canada. And finally, he decided to settle in Guatemala. So in 1947, part of the family went to Guatemala and part of the family went back to Colombia and took care of the work in Colombia until we were able to leave. But you know what the devil, devil said in, through my mother? He said, I ran your family out of Colombia. And the oppression was so heavy that my dad just couldn't stand being there any longer. So finally he decided to relocate. Well, I remember I was a boy about 12 years of age, 11 or 12 years of age, when we moved into that new subdivision, and I came down with asthma. And I would have these terrible bouts of asthma. Oh, we blamed it first on the house. The house was not, it was partially finished and it was very humid. I mean, it wasn't even stuccoed. And so the, you could see the water, you know, the humidity on the walls and on the sea the roofs. And, and we were blaming all this asthma on, uh, on the humidity. But you know what it was? It was part of the curse. And, uh, I grew up with this disease and, uh, at least three, four times a year, I would get desperately ill. I took all kinds of medications. I had a lot of medicine, injections, and pills. And whenever I travel, I always carried these pills with me because I would get it just like that. If I went into an air-conditioned room, I'd start wheezing. Or if I went out from a heated room to the, the cold, chilly evening air, I would come down with an uh, asthma. And so, uh, but in 1962, Betty and I discovered the truths of divine healing through our own personal Bible study, and I decided to renounce my medicine. I said, I'm not going to take any more medication. I'm going to trust God for my healing. And I thought, you know, getting rid of all the medicine, that God would heal me like that, you know, instantaneously. After all, that was a very courageous act of faith, but it didn't happen. From 62 on, I would, I suffered asthma cold turkey. I never went back on my medication. And the attacks got worse. They were more intense, they were more frequent, and sometimes I was at the death door. And just one breath away from eternity. And I, you know, at about that time, the charismatic movement began, and there was all these books on, on healing that were coming out, and and you know the power of praise, and so I praise my way through the attack, but I know I wouldn't get better. And by positive confession, I'd confess my way through it, and it wouldn't get better. And I had they did. I even had demons cast out of me several times. I didn't get better. It got worse and worse and worse. But you know what happened? 
when my mother was set free in 1974 from that curse that was set on her by this lady called Primitiva, I was healed like that. No one even prayed for me at that time. I just noticed I was healed, and I never had another attack of asthma. Only once since 1974, about two years ago, with Betty and the family, we were in Canada, and this thing wanted to come back on me. I was in my sister's house in Canada. So there must have been a root in that house. There was something operating in my sister that jumped on me, because for two nights or three nights, I had a battle against this. I didn't let it come back on me, but it tried to at least. So here's a family, a missionary family, serving God on the mission field to the best of our ability. My dad was honest. He was sincere. He was sold out to missions. He sacrificed the family in order to establish that work in Columbia. And yet the family came under a curse of witchcraft. The witchcraft can affect not only individuals. In fact, it can affect what? Entire families. Amen? There was a case in point. You might say, why? Well, it's, it's, I've discovered several things, you know, down through the years that could have been a way or an opening for the demon standard and work in my family. My parents didn't get exactly get along too well. You know, they had a very distant relationship. In fact, towards the end of their lives, they were like two strangers under the same roof. And there were a lot of problems there that could have been the cause that, you know, the way the enemy infiltrated the home and caused this thing, this thing to develop. Okay. Now let's uh, turn now to the book of Galatians. See, we must be on our guard. I don't think we need to be worried. We not, don't need to be fearful. But we sure have to be on our guard. Because if something suddenly begins to happen in your home, something unexpected, you must begin to suspect that the enemy is infiltrating your home. A sudden reverse in your financial status. Sudden illness. You or your children. If you start squabbling with your wife, and you used to have a, a really, you know, beautiful relationship, and all of a sudden you, you begin to fight and begin to argue, and, and uh, it gets really heated and probably violent, you need to suspect that the enemy is, has infiltrated your home. Now let's go to Galatians 3. All foolish Galatians, and the word foolish there is stupid. It's a stronger word than foolish. All foolish Galatians, who hath what? Bewitch you. You know, some of the modern translations have changed that word. Who has deceived you? Because a lot of the translators today are not spirit-filled people. They, can't, they don't understand anything of the spirit world. They don't understand things that have to do with the occult. And so they thought this word was a mis-translation, so they, they softened the tone. They used the word deceive instead of the word bewitch. And what happened was the churches of Galatia began in revival. Began in revival. Read what verse 5 says. He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you. And there, there was a revival spirit. The church began in revival. But what happened? Huh? Things begin to change. The spiritual tone, the tone of the church began to go down and down and down. They who had begun in the Spirit again tried to perfect themselves how? Through the flesh. They were going through the same motions, you know. They, they still clapped, they still danced, and they still operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but it was not the anointing. The anointing was no longer there. They were doing it out of habit, by rote. Now, what had happened? Let me tell you what I believe. I believe that church had been infiltrated, or those churches had been infiltrated. And we can find it here in chapter 2, verse 4. And that because of false brethren, unawares one brought in. They didn't come in on their own initiative. They were brought in. They were planted there. It was a conspiracy against those churches. A plot. They had been sent by the enemy to disrupt, to divide. So because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in tribally. To spy out our liberty. Notice the, the attack was directed against Christian liberty. It says to bring them that they might bring us into bondage. 
The enemy wanted to recapture the ground he had lost. He wanted to bring those Christians back into bondage. How, did, how? By infiltrating the church with religious spirits. You know, there's a lot of religious demons, and they're the worst. They're the hardest to deal with. Spirits of legalism, that's what infiltrated the church in Galatia, or the churches in Galatia. But anything like dogmatism, sectarianism, ritualism, denominationalism, etc., etc., all these are demons, demon spirits. Someone should preach a message on the religious spirits that counterfeit the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of that. There's all kinds of false ministries in the body of Christ today, and there's all kinds of false gifts in the body of Christ today. But if any time we need it, that spiritual radar to be in full operation, it's today. Today's when we need deliverance, and I mean discernment, to be able to discover and denounce the works of the devil in the church. Amen? I believe that these false brethren entered the church, and from inside they were operating in the occult trying to bring this, these churches back into bondage. Amen? Churches can be attacked. I think I've already told this story here, but most of you weren't here when I told it. But back in the 70s, Calvary Church in Guatemala City, the church that our pastor for a season, was one uh, was the most prominent church in Guatemala. It was known all throughout Guatemala and throughout Central America. In 1963, this church had experienced a revival that had not only benefited that church, that had benefited all the churches of our mission, and many other churches, many large churches were born out of that revival in Calvary Church. And that was the first church, I believe, in the world, and I'm not exaggerating, that practiced deliverance as a ministry to the body of Christ on a daily basis. You know, before that in Korea and in China and other parts of the world, they had some deliverance cases. But this was the first church that established deliverance as part of its total ministry to the, to the world. And so people came from all over the country to be set free, and hundreds of curses and spells were destroyed there. And I believe many times, if we don't take the proper measures, those demons will go back and report what has happened to them. We'll go back to the witch doctors and the, and the warlocks and tell them exactly where they, how they were defeated and how they were expelled out of the bodies of the victims. So anyways, the church was so well known that 14 witch doctors banded together to destroy it. And I'm going to tell you how they did it. I was at home one morning, about uh, 6.30 in the morning, when I got this urge to go down to the church building. Uh, that uh, Our Bible school, uh, where we have trained hundreds of workers that are now scattered all over the American continent, operated in our church building. That's where we held our classes. And I used to go down there about 8 o'clock every morning to teach the first class. But that morning in particular, I just felt, felt an urge to go. I mean, it, it was an urgency. And I told Betty, and she might not even remember this, I don't know if she does or not, but I told Betty, I need to get down to church. I'm not going to eat any breakfast today. I'm just going to go down there. When I got there, I was surprised to find out that the church building was wide open. The front door was open, and I walked in and looked around. There was no soul in sight. So I said, somebody broke in. And immediately I decided to look for the more, most valuable things in the building, the musical instruments. We had an organ. We had a, if I'm not mistaken, a piano. My accordion was there, several guitars and other instruments. Nothing had been touched. So I went to look at the PA system. They hadn't even taken a microphone, nothing. I said, isn't this strange? Well, then I noticed some items were missing. Uh, on both sides of the platform, there were curtains for decor, uh, just to create an, you know, an atmosphere that, for worship and praise. And one of the curtains had been, the one on the left-hand side had been ripped off and taken. Then I noticed the clock that we had up here, right in front of the pulpit, uh, on a beam, was gone. And I noticed an offering box that we had back near the door was gone. And I noticed that a Bible that we shipped on the pulpit was gone. And I said, isn't this crazy? They didn't take the musical instruments. They didn't take the PA system. They didn't take any value. They just took the curtain, a, a clock, an offering box, a Bible. 
Well, I sort of dismissed the thing. I uh, I think I told a few people, but I didn't pay too much importance to the thing. But one thing we noticed immediately is that a heavy fall of oppression came over the building. And uh, people deserted the church. The attendance went down about 50%. The church that had been in revival for, I forget, maybe 12, 13 years. This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thanksgiving weekend teaching and deliverance camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is Friday afternoon meeting. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. The attendance went down about 50%. The church that had been in revival for, I forget, maybe 12, 13 years. I mean, we had to have service night after night between 1963 and 1974. The church building had never been closed. We had service. And when we tried to close it, the people still came. And suddenly, the attendance plummeted. And those that came, came late. And those that came would sit in the back. And those that came would just sit there with the bra. You couldn't get them to sing. You couldn't get them to pray. You couldn't get them to witness. It was just bad, you know. Support, the financial support of the church came, went down to nothing. And the people stopped giving. Now, everything was wrong. And when we noticed that, then I said, uh, I called some of the elders and leaders of the church together, and I said, I believe the church is under demonic attack. Let's call a general fast. So we invited all the church to come on a Saturday to fast and pray. And usually when we'd have a general fast, about 100 or 150 would show up. That Saturday, I don't think there were more than 30 people there. And it was, it was tough. I mean, when you're fighting against the powers of darkness, it, you get sleepy, you get weary, and you get so distracted. Well, anyways, we prayed through the day, and about 3 o'clock, some of us went out into a little room in the back where we had most of our deliverance cases, and we decided to pray together and ask the Lord for guidance to ask him to show us what was happening. And one of the brethren, name was Mario Mendes, who developed some prophetic gifts, as we were praying, went, had a vision. He went kind of in like a trance-like state and had a vision. He saw, you know, he saw these 14 witch doctors coming together to put a curse on the church. And in order to put a curse on the church, they had to steal these items. So they sent somebody in, break in the building, and stole all these things so that the curse would be more effective. You know, when you when a witch doctor wants to put a curse on you, they try to get a hold of a picture or a lock of hair or something, a piece of clothing, something. They try to get so that they can use this as a point of contact. Well, that's what they did that day. And the brother said, the Lord showed me these items were placed in a package and buried across the street at the foot of a lamp pole. And so what did we do? Well, we came against all the powers of evil. I remember we took a shovel, went out there, unearthed. We found the package that had some roots, that had some herbs. And immediately we made a bonfire and we burnt the things up. Because uh, we didn't want to have any... And, he left, you know. and as we prayed, and as we bound, and as we wrestled in the spirit, the cloud of oppression lifted and was gone. The amazing thing was that next day, which was Sunday, the church was packed up. Like there's nothing that happened. Yeah. And that's an evidence of that how witchcraft can destroy a church. Right? And people can infiltrate a church and begin to work against the pastor and against the people of the church to try to bring that church to its knees. Let's go to the book of Revelation. And we have the story of the church at Thyatira. Where, Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write. Now notice what verse 20 says. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, what was her name? Jezebel. Jezebel. 
which calleth himself a prophet or a prophetess to teach and what? And to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit for adultery with her into great tribulation. Okay. Now, there is a church, one of the seven churches of Asia, that had been infiltrated by the, the, the occultist. They had planted in the church a woman called what? Jezebel. And she was what? She was a witch. I think that she was appropriately called Jezebel. I don't know if her real name was Jezebel, but she sure had the Jezebel spirit. And do you know who Jezebel was according to the Old Testament? Let's go to the book of Second Kings chapter 9. Second Kings chapter 9. And there it will tell us who this Jezebel was. Second Kings 9, 22. And it came to pass when Horm saw Jehu, that he said, Ah, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. What was she involved in? Witchcraft. She was a woman of loose morals. Uh, she was a, a whore that was involved in the occult. And you remember Ahab? He was, he was wishy-washy. He had a, he was a spineless creature. And how do you think this woman manipulated that man, forced that man to do anything according to her pleasure? How? Through witchcraft. Have you read First Kings chapter 19? Remember after Elijah had that great victory on Mount Carmel? He had defeated and he had slain how many prophets of Baal? 450 prophets. He was courageous. And he was the epitome of bravery as he ministered there on top of Mount Carmel. He destroyed idolatry and with one swipe. But what happened the next day? Read chapter 19, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when he saw that, he arose, and what? He ran. He fled for his life. He went for his life. And the next... Well, in a few moments, we find him sitting under a juniper tree in a, yeah, a pity party, in a fit of depression, Amen. feeling sorry for himself, believing he was the only one left, that there was no one else in the whole world that was faithful to the Lord God of Israel. What had Jezebel used to make this great man of God flee? Huh? Witchcraft. I imagine she spent the night casting hexes and curses on, on Elijah. He came under heavy oppression, and when he, he felt, he felt, you know, heard about the threat, he just decided to run. And then we see him first under the juniper tree, and then we see him in the cave. I forget the name of the place. Uh, Heidi. Hiding for out of fear for his life. Where do you think that depression came from? Don't you know that most depression is demon oppression? I, I mean, Christians today go to clinical psychologists. They go to psychiatrists to get help, and most many of them are ungodly people that don't understand about uh, the nature of a Christian. You know. And they come out more confused and more distraught than when they first went there. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 13. It shows us there what witchcraft can do on Christians. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about Christians. It says here, verse 17, Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people. Sad to say, most people that are involved in the occult are women. Probably because they are the weaker sex. They are easy, uh, easy prey. I mean, it's easier for Satan to seduce and to deceive a woman than a man. I don't know why, but, but it's true. Yeah. Now let's read on. 
the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of thy own heart and prophesy thou against them. Now, I want you, as we read this piece of passage of Scripture, you'll find that five times it talks about my people, my people, my people. Once it talks about the righteous. So it's not talking about the unsaved world. It's not talking about people that are outside God's, the flock of, or, the, or, or the family of God. It's talking about God's people. Let's read verse 18 and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Whoa! Lamentation. Woe to the women that sow pillows to all armholes. Other translations say they sow magic bands. How many have a uh, translation that differs? Well, what does it say there, sister? Just read that verse. Verse 18. Okay. You, you know the word magic there? Magic charms, magic bands. What is the purpose? To catch souls, to hunt souls. That talks about imprisoning them and slaying them. Now, let's go and continue to read. Will you hunt the souls of my people? And will you save the souls alive that come unto you? And will you pollute me among my people? Now, here's the payment. For handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread. Now, notice this. White magic and black magic. First, it mentions black magic. To slay the souls that should not die. It's not their time to go. And yet through witchcraft they can slay the souls of those that should not die. Can hasten death. They can bring death upon people. There are curses of death. And then the great magic. And to save the souls alive that should not live. To prolong life. Through white magic people can be caused to live that ought to die. Because of the life of, the, of iniquity. And yet, because they recur to Satan, uh, their life can be lengthened. So life can be shortened through black magic, and life can be lengthened through white magic. Amen? Then let's go on reading. By your lying to my people. Notice how often it says, my people, my people, my people. Lying to my people that hear your lies. Wherefore, that saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your pillows, or your charms, or your... Bands or whatever it might be, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. I mean, they can draw your soul out of your body through witchcraft. They can cause your soul to travel. They can trap your soul. I, I've already told this story. I don't know if I told it at Higgins or I told it at Lake Hamilton, but several years ago, a young man in his late 20s came to me. And he, for prayer, I, he came in, into the church building. I saw him standing there all nervous and uptight. And I walked up and I said, could I help you in any way? He said, are you the pastor of this church? I said, yes, I am. And he said, can I speak to you? And I said, sit down. We'll have a little chat. He said, my grandmother advised me to come here. She's a Christian. He said, uh, I'm a witch, a brujo. I'm involved in the cult. And uh, I work as a photographer for a living. And I have in my house a little room that I call my dark room. And you don't know how dark it is. So I keep it under lock and, uh, and not even my wife or my mother can go into that room. I go in there and lock myself in, but it's not to, to you know, uh, process film. It's to work my, my occult uh, practices. He said, in that, that little room in my house is lined, the walls are lined with little jars. And in every jar there are pictures and there are, uh, belong, uh, you know, lots of hair or pieces of clothing of people that I've put a curse on. And every one of those jars has a name. He said, I've worked witchcraft for years on people. Many people in my neighborhood, people I know, people I work with, I put under curse, and many of them today are either alcoholics due to witchcraft, or the mental patients due to witchcraft. He said some of them are bedridden, some of them are, are people that have, I know people that have died because of the curses that I've put on. My grandmother is a Christian, she's been witnessing to me, and because of what she's told me, I've come under, you know, heavy, uh, how would you say, conviction. So he said, I feel I'm going crazy. I need help. So I began to minister to him, and I told him he had to repent, and he had to submit 
to the Lutherans. He said, that afternoon he made a decision for Jesus Christ. It was a Friday. And he said, what should I do now? I said, you're going to have to destroy what you have been doing. I said, tomorrow, between now and Sunday, I want you to go and get those jars and put them in boxes and take them to a ravine behind your house. Guatemala City is surrounded by, by ravines. The whole city, is, there's these deep, like canyons around the city. And I said, he was a block or two from one of these canyons. And I said, take the boxes, and as you, you take jar, each jar, open it up, and say, I release your spirit in the name of Jesus, then throw the jar into the ravine. So you had them, these people were trapped. Now, it's hard to understand these things. You know, Americans are so rationalistic. But he had people trapped in those little jars. Their souls were trapped. He had caused them to fly. He had hunted them. He had catched them, as this scripture says. And they were bound in these jars. So he went out there, I think it was Sunday morning before dawn, and he opened jar after jar, and he would say, I release you in the name of Jesus, and the clothes are open. He had... I imagine so a hundred jars. That morning when he came to church, he was just smiling. He was glowing, you know, because he had obeyed. And as a result of that, all this burden of guilt and condemnation had been lifted, and he was free in his spirit to serve God. But it shows your brethren, that through witchcraft you can hunt the souls and catch the souls. Now, let's go on reading. I'm just rushing here. It says in verse 20, Behold, I am against your pillars, wherewith ye, ye there, there, hunt the, souls, hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go in the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now, verse 22, because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. There's depression. There's grief and sorrow. You have made the heart of the righteous, not of the unrighteous, the righteous. Sad how? Through your lies. That's through your magical rites. Whom I have not made sad. Sad. And through right magic you have strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not turn from his wicked way by promising him life. You see, the two kinds of magic, black magic and white magic. Black magic is destructive, white magic is curative. Through black magic you can cure, through white magic you can prolong life. And yet it says here that through magic these people can make the souls of men and women Christians, we would call them today, sad. That's depression. How much depression you have suffered is not the result of some demonic influence that has come against you because someone in your neighborhood or someone in your workplace hates you and has played psychic prayers against you and has cast curses on you. Amen? And instead of recurring to the world and asking the doctors or psychiatrists to give you some pills and potions to keep you functioning, some tranquilizers, uppers and downers and all that stuff to make you sleep and make you half function, what should you do? You seek God so that God can set you free once and for all of that demonic bondage. Amen? See, witchcraft is real. And we must be aware of the fact that it's increasing alarmingly here in America. Especially in the great, the big cities, but it, it's it, it's filtering down into the little towns and down into the rural areas. More satanic rituals are being practiced all over America. Even the police department is finding evidences of this in old barns and out in the forest, out in the wilderness. They're having the black magic masses. In fact, I've known of several churches lately in America that have been broken into and they practice their satanic rituals right inside. The churches. They plastered the walls with, with uh, demonic uh, insignias. So we shouldn't be surprised. And we must be careful because otherwise we can be victimized. Now let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Just, I'm not going to belabor the point. Revelation, chapter 18, verse 23. It's talking here about Babylon. That city, some believe when it talks about Babylon, it's talking about 
the city of Rome, or the religion that has its headquarters in Rome. Now notice what it says here in verse 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more in, at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations, what? Deceived. Entire nations can come under the influence of Satanism. There is a country not too far from here called Haiti, where brutal reigns supreme. And it's the most poverty ridden country on the American continent. In fact, there, uh, some time ago I saw a National Geographic magazine that talked about Haiti and the Dominican Republic. They share the same island. The island is called Hispaniola. And they took some aerial photographs, and you can see the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic from a high elevation. On the, the, the Dominican Republic side, it's less burdened. I mean, it's, it's a very fertile country that exports food to Puerto Rico and even the United States. On the other side, Haiti, it was eroded. It was, the country was just drought stricken. What's the difference? Is it just geographic or climatic? There is a spiritual for whom? Because Haiti for years, Haiti was consecrated to the devil. Haiti has had some presidents, including Papa Doug de Valier, who was a high priest of Satanism. And the whole country has been dedicated to Satan. There's other countries in Latin America. Even Brazil has 30 million Satanists involved in these satanic occults, like Umbanda and Kimbanda and Macumba and Candomblé. We have a work in Brazil, and the church is situated in a area of Sao Paulo called Piritula, and half a block from there, there's a satanic temple. And I walked right in front of that temple, and there was two grotesque images guarding the entrance. And but there was, the place was full of smoke and some eerie music floated out through the, through the air. I mean, it was one of the temples to one of these cults that worship Satan and invoke Satan. See, people around the world are getting deeply involved in their cult. Now let's turn to the book of Numbers and perhaps this will be the last passage of scripture, perhaps, perhaps. Numbers 22. How many read the story of Balaam? Who was Balaam? Who was Balaam? Can someone tell me? Was he a true prophet or a false prophet? He was a true prophet of God to begin with when he started out. When you read in Second Peter chapter 2, and I think it's about verse 16, it talks about Balaam the prophet. And he was well known. He was greatly admired and he was greatly uh, respected. Now, one of the problems why Balaam went wrong was that he was isolated from God's people. That's why I was talking about being out there alone. The Israel was coming from Egypt on its way to Canaan and Balaam should have been with them. He should have gone to meet them and accompany them. But he didn't. He was out there in the boom. He's all by himself. Remember what happened. Israel, in order to get to the river Jordan and cross the river and enter the, the promised land, had to go through several heathen kingdoms. And one of the kingdoms they had to go through was Moab. And Moses was a gentleman. He was would send delegations to ask for permission to go through the land. He said, we will go through the royal way. We won't lap up your waters. We won't... Eat your crops. Just let us go through. We'll go through as fast as we can. Now, Balak said, no. Under no circumstances am I going to permit you to come through my land. And Moses knew they would have to go a roundabout way. They would have to detour. And, and God's people by, by then were weary and worn. And Moses knew that this was going to be hard on them. That's why he asked permission to go through there. But Balak said, no. In order to make sure that the Israelites would not go through, uh, through Moab, Balak deci decided to hire Balaam to cast a curse on Israel. Now remember, by then Israel was, was, uh, 
Huge. I mean, there might have been a couple million people. Men and women, boys and girls. And that is what it says here in chapter 22 of Numbers. I want to rush through this. In verse 6, he sent a delegation. He sent men that were in high office to try to entice and convince Balaam to go and put a curse on God's people. Verse 22. Come now therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. He was afraid of them. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. That was the purpose. They were going to put a, he was trying to put a curse on God's people. First, to what do what? To slay them, and simply to drive them out of the land. Now that was witchcraft. And Balaam should have turned the offer down flat. I mean, he shouldn't even hesitate for a moment when he knew what this king wanted. But you know, the offer was very juicy. He was offering fame and fortune. So Balaam, very spiritually minded, I mean, he was a pious king. He said, you men stay here, I'll spend the night, and I'm going to spend, I'm going to pray all night. I'm going to ask for directions. So he went in this closet or in this little, his bedroom, and began to pray, and about midnight, God appeared to him and said, if someone comes, you just say, no, I cannot go. Just turn them down. Well, Balaam did like that. He got up the next morning, and he was, he was, uh, you know, his attitude was negative. He said, I want to go, but God will not let me go. He's a party pooper. He's spoiling my fun. He's ruining my chances for advancement. So the men left and went back to Balak, the king, and said, you know, we discerned that the man was kind of wavering. He wants to come, but there's something that's uh, interfering. If you will just up the ante, if you will offer something, you know, bigger and better, we, we believe he'll relent. He'll, he'll give in. So the king sent a second delegation. And they came and they offered greater honors and greater uh, rewards. And so Balaam, instead of saying, no, I can't go, he said, you just stay here, spend the night, and I'll see what God has to say. And when he went to prayer, the Lord appeared again. But this time he said, go. Uh, Balaam should have stopped right there and said, what? You know, something wrong has happened. He even said later, according to chapter 24, verse 19, chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? He knew that God just didn't change his mind. So he should have said, if God spoke the first time, this must be the devil. Or vice versa. Can't be the same person. Because God the first time said no, and now he says yes. Well, we could say that first time was God's directive will, and the second time was God's permissive will. Although I don't believe in God's permissive will. I think God's will is one. Amen. Now, God sometimes will give in to you. will let you as a free agent do whatever you want to, but that doesn't mean it's his will. Directive or permissive. That's right. Amen. You're just in disobedience. And God knows you're going to do your thing anyway, so he just lets you do it. Well, that's what he did to Balaam. He said, just go. If you want to go, go. So next morning before dawn, he harnessed his horse or his donkey or his ass. And he started on his way to Moab. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord came to meet him as an enemy. To counteract them. And you remember the story. Three times he tried to, to, you know, just move, and the donkey wouldn't let him. First it went off and got off the road into a, by a detour or a bypass or whatever it is, and, and uh, Balaam had to beat the poor animal, bring him back to the road. Second time the animal went, lay up against the wall and nearly crushed Balaam's leg or foot. Third time, the animal just sat, sat, flopped down right in the middle of the road and wouldn't budge. You know the story. Amen. Finally, the angel said, well, you're still determined. Go on. Keep going. So he went. And we're just trying to make the story short. When he got there, 
the king asked him to put a curse on Israel. And how many times did Balaam attempt to do it? Three times. From three different locations. They made animal sacrifices. He, he, he uh, invoked, he, uh, you know, he used all his prophetic gifts to try to put a curse on Israel. But it wouldn't take. You know what witch doctors have told me, those that have been converted to Christ, that when they were hired to put a curse on Christians, they would send out feelers. And when they found out that that Christian individual or family was living as God tells in his word, they would refuse to put the curse on them. They, would, they told me that even if they would pay them $1,000, they wouldn't put a curse on them. You know why? The curse would just bark right back on them. Whatever they attempted to do, that Christian family would come right back on his, their own family. So they would, they would be very careful who they would put a curse on. They would never put a curse on Christians that were living uh, as they should. Righteousness and holiness. Okay, Balaam tried to put a curse on Israel, but he couldn't. Now let's find out why he couldn't. Amen? This is very important for our own protection. This is something you must take note of. Let's go here to chapter 23. And we're going to find out the reasons why the curse wouldn't take, wouldn't work. And we can find it here in verse 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Verse 21. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Just notice the spiritual condition of God's people at that time. The old generation had passed away. Their bodies had had fallen by the wayside in the wilderness. This was a new generation. These were the children of those that came out of Egypt. And it seems to be that at that moment they were in pretty good spiritual condition because the Bible says that God could not see iniquity and he could not see perverseness in Israel. Amen? Okay. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of the unicorn, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. No enchantment, no divination would work. Why? Because of the spiritual condition of God's people. There was no sin in the camp. Did you hear that? No sin in the camp. Do you want to keep free from witchcraft? Do you want to keep your family free, your, your free and your church free from any witchcraft? You're going to have to clean up your life. No besetting sins. No secret sins. You've got to make things right with God. The problem today is that the church has a different concept of sin than we used to have 25, 30 years ago. Things back then that would cause you to be put under discipline or put on probation, suspended, huh? today are tolerated in church. I mean, our definition of sin is not the same as the Bible. Today, fear is not considered a sin, and yet the Bible calls it a sin. Huh? Bitterness is not considered a sin, but yet the Bible calls it a sin. Anger is not considered a sin, it's, but the Bible calls it a sin. Today, these are false. These are little quirks of your imagination. These are little deficiencies. Sometimes they say it, they're chemical, you know. There's a chemical imbalance that makes you be what you are and do what you do. Is that true? Well, the Bible calls that sin. What is the point of contact for demon spirits in our lives? Sin. They latch on to sin. They take a handle on us, on us through sin. So if, if a curse is sent against us and against our family or against our business, against our church, and the curse comes but finds no place, it just goes back. Amen. It bounces back. The prince of this world cometh to me, but he findeth nothing in me. There was nothing in Jesus. There was no point of conflict. There was no sin that he could grasp, that he could hold on to. But the problem with us today is there's too much sin. Amen? We've been too careless in the area of sin. We just tolerate a lot of things that God forbids in his word. Now let's notice the rest of this passage of Scripture. First of all, it says, He has not beheld iniquity, neither has seen perversion in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. When we clean up our act, we're going to 
enjoy God's constant presence in our lives, in our homes. Amen? You know, when Joseph went down to Egypt, God went with him. When he was in the house of Potiphar, God was with him. When he was in the jailhouse, God was with him. Now, Jesus once said, you know, the Father has never left me. He's always with me. And th these are the words. Because the things that please him, I always do. How can you ensure God's presence in your life, in your home? By always doing the things that God pleases, please God. By always obeying the Lord. By always honoring the Lord. That's why it says here that the Lord, his God, is with him. Then it goes on to say, and the shout of a king is among him. You know, Israel, Israel was a kingdom. Many think that the kingdom of God began when Jesus came. But truly, really, the kingdom began back, yeah. Israel had a king. In fact, when they asked for an earthly king, when they asked for a human being to be king over them, God said, they haven't rejected you. Samuel, they have rejected me so that I cannot reign over them. Who was the king of Israel? God. The Bible says, the shout of a king. That's talking about worship. That's talking about praise. Amen? The shout of victory in the camp. If you want to create an atmosphere where demons will not take a hold of you or take a hold of your family, you've got to create a, an atmosphere of praise. Amen? Amen. I think uh, playing those Hosanna tapes and other tapes will creates a, a beautiful atmosphere in your home. Amen? You've got to be praising God constantly. God inhabits the praises of his people. Now let's go on to read here. Verse 22, God brought them out of Egypt. They were no longer in Egypt. And Egypt is a type of what? Of the world. See? We're, we're out of Egypt, but Egypt's not out of us in many cases. We still enjoy worldly enticements. We still enjoy worldly entertainment. The things of the world still attract us. Worldly styles. Worldly trappings. The Bible says that if we want to be free so that no curse sent against us will affect us, we have to get out of Egypt, and Egypt has to be <laughs> taken out of us. Amen? Amen, brethren? God, God brought them out of Egypt. He has, it were, the strength of a unicorn or a buffalo. Strength. In Ephesians 3.16, it says that we are strengthened with might in the inner man by the Spirit. The Bible says that we should be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And, that, and the reference is to spiritual warfare. So if we want to be victorious, we have to be strong. Isn't that true? Amen. We have to keep our strength built up. We have to renew our strength as eagles every day. For example, here in First John chapter 2, when it talks about young people, I want to just read a verse for you. It says here in 1 John 2.14, it says, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. How can we overcome the wicked one when he attacks us? Especially the witch, witchcraft and sorcery. How? We have to be strong. Amen. You know, in order for, for you to resist all the germs and viruses that are floating around in the air, you have to keep your strength up. When, when your immunological system is broken down, when your defenses are lowered, then you become easy prey to any disease. Who are the people that catch the flu so easily and come down with all kinds of people that, that through a lack of sleep or a lack of nutrition, uh, for some reason or another, their defenses have been lowered and then they can pick up anything that's floating out there. We are surrounded. Listen, there's millions, billions, trillions of germs in this room today. Of all kinds of diseases. We're breathing them in. But why don't we develop those diseases? Why? Because we're strong. There's, our bodies resist these attacks. Amen? Our immunological system is kept built up through proper exercise, through proper nutrition, through proper sleep, through you know, good habits. Uh, you break them down. Smoking, you're breaking down your 
uh, your uh, immunological system. Drinking, you're breaking down your immune And so you become an easy prey. Amen? Now, spiritually, we have to keep our immunological system built up. See, we have two immunological systems. We have the natural, and we have a supernatural. Amen? The Bible says, The angel of the Lord kept with round about them that. There's the condition. See, uh, a lot of people say, Oh, I'm under the blood. That's Pentecostal people have been the worst. I'm under the blood. The devil cannot touch me. Where did you get that? See, every verse in Scripture that talks about protection is condition. Amen? The angel of the Lord kept around about them that fear him. And what is the fear of the Lord? We heard about that this morning. What is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is to abhor evil, to hate it with a passion. To hate what God hates. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. I gave a four-part series on the fear of the Lord, and I think it's there for sale on in the tape and book table. It's a very important message, and it's a message that is not preached by evangelists and teachers today. But that's our protection. If we live in the fear of the Lord, if we walk in the fear of the Lord, we are protected from evil. Amen? But you can go on and on through Scripture, and you'll find many verses. Let's go to Deuteronomy 23:14. In order for us to be defended from all demonic attacks through the occult or directly by evil spirits that uh, Satan sends against us, we have to meet certain conditions. And here's one, Deuteronomy 23:14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give thee up thine enemies before thee. Before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. How do we have to keep our camp? Holy. Because if there's an unclean thing in us, what will the Lord do? He turns away from us. If we want the Lord to walk in our camp, to dwell in our camp, we must clean up our lives. Live our lives according to the scripture or teachings of the word. Zechariah 9.8. Zechariah 9.8. I'm nearly finished, and it's nearly five o'clock. Now I will camp about my house because of the en- of the army, because of him that passes by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now I have seen with mine eye. There's a promise of protection. God has to keep his eyes on us. If he turns away from us, <laughs> we're finished. See? The Bible says here that God will encamp about us, about our house, because of the army, because of him that passes by, because of him that returneth. The Bible shows us that the enemy is in constant activity. Doesn't that the scripture say that in First Peter chapter 5? That the devil, like a roaring lion, what? Yeah, but it says something before that. Wanders to and fro, wanders around us. He's just waiting for an opportunity. He's just waiting for the right moment to jump us. But if the Lord is in our camp, if he's camping round about us, the enemy cannot touch us. Amen? Now let's look at another verse. 1 John chapter 5. The reason I'm giving these verses is so that we won't leave this place full of fear and panic. You You might have people that are involved in the occult right in your neighborhood. And they hate you because you're a Christian. And they'll work on you. They'll try to destroy uh, your resistance to evil spirits. Notice what it says here in 1 John 5. And in verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And what is born of God in us? It's not. It's our spirit, our new man, our new creation, Christ Jesus. That new creation is holy. That new creation never sins, has never sinned, never will. But the new creation dwells within a, a physical body. How do Christians sin? Do they sin with their spirits? No, they just sin with their body and with their mind. Amen? The new thing that God has created within us, which is called the new man, born of God, sinneth not. Now let's continue to read. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself in that wicked one, toucheth him not. Amen? Now, what is our responsibility according to this verse of Scripture? 
so that when a curse is sent against us, against our family, against our business, against our church, against our community, against our nation, so that a curse will not take what is our responsibility. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. We're not going to be kept unless we keep ourselves. See, there's human responsibility involved in this. And I could give you at least 10, 15 verses that talk about keeping ourselves. We must keep ourselves unspotted in this world. We must keep ourselves in the love of God. In fact, back in the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, there are verses that talk about keeping ourselves. And I'm just going to read a couple for you. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, and with this we'll come and bring it to an end. Proverbs 16, 17. Just listen to this. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Proverbs 19, 16. It says, He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul. Proverbs 21, 23. Whosoever keep, whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Proverbs 22, 5. He, he that doth keepeth, he that keepeth soul, let me see, thorns and snares are in the way of, of the forward. He that doth keep the soul shall be far from them. Uh, Proverbs 13, 3. These verses tell us that we must keep ourselves in order to be kept. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. So it says here about keeping our mouth, about keeping our mind, about keeping ourselves in the will of God, about keeping ourselves from snares and from thorns. And if we keep ourselves, then God will keep us. Amen? How many want to be protected from all these curses and spells and hexes that are being cast on by people, ungodly people, on God's people? You could be the next victim. But it, it doesn't have to happen to you. I mean, it, it ought to just bounce. You should have a, uh, an invisible shield around you. The Bible talks about a wall of fire. These things should bounce right off. But see, we break down our defenses by careless living. Amen? By careless living. And many of us have not been living the kind of life that is pleasing in God's sight. And because of that, the day that someone attempts something against us, it's going to work. It's going to work. Amen? So, we need to be on our guard, brethren. I know what it is by personal experience. I've been under curse. My family's been under curse. The church has been under curse. And the only way we've been able to withstand is by obeying the scriptural principles, discovering them and implementing them. Don't confuse God's curses with Satan's curses. Amen? They're two different things. You must make a separation. Uh, Satan is our enemy, and he's out to destroy God's people today, more than ever before. And he's going to use all his craftiness and all his cruelty against God's people because he knows his time is short. But if we keep ourselves in obedience to the word, we keep ourselves under the protection of the Holy Spirit, we keep our lives cleaned up. As soon as we're conscious of having done something wrong, we confess it and we remit it so that God can permit us, for, for, forgive us, then nothing can harm us. Did you hear that? The Bible says, Behold, I give you a power to tread upon serpents, upon scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall harm you. I would have preached on spiritual authority today. The only way you're going to keep yourself free is by exercising proper spiritual authority. By being bold in exercising your authority in Christ Jesus. And when you use your authority, nothing can hurt you. Nothing can harm you. The problem is most of us don't know who we are and most of us don't understand what we have in Christ Jesus. Most of us don't know where we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And when the enemy attacks, we're defenseless. So let's discover these things and let's put them into practice in our lives. And I'll tell you something. Then no arm that is forged against us will ever harm us. Amen? God will keep us free. But if we continue to live, live slothful lives, careless lives, and we indulge in worldly things and sinful things, we're going to be, we're going to be attacked and we're going to be victimized by the enemy. Amen? Why don't we stand and pray right now? Why don't we all raise our hands?
I want you, first of all, to thank God for His divine protection upon your life. Thank God for the angel of the Lord that's always willing to camp around. Thank you. Uh, thank God for the covering, for the Holy Spirit, for who the Holy Spirit is and for what the Holy Spirit does in response to our faith. Thank God for His protection upon your life, upon your family. Yes. Hallelujah. Be grateful. This is Thanksgiving time, and we should be grateful for what God has provided through Christ Jesus. Thank Him for the blood. Thank Him for the Word. Thank Him for the Spirit. Thank Him for all these divine elements that have been made available to us, so that we can walk and live in victory over Satan. Amen. And now let's, let's come against all the powers of darkness. Amen that are attacking Christians here and everywhere. Amen? Let's break any curse upon our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we rise up against Satan and his demonic kingdom. We come against the kingdom of darkness, against the power of darkness that is ruling in the world today. We come against Satan and all his demonic hosts that are attempting to bring the church of Jesus Christ to its knees. We know that Satan has an ultimate goal, and that is to defeat and destroy your your church here on earth. But now with the authority of Christ, we rise up against Satan and all the workers of darkness. We come against witchcraft and magic and divination and sorcery. We come against all these demonic practices that are being used today to bring the church to a state of um, defeat and a state of impotency. Now in the name of Jesus Christ, we command you, Satan, and you're here within hearing, we come against you and we command you to release your hold upon God's people. We take back the grounds that have been given to you. We take back the rights that have been allotted to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we declare ourselves to be free of all demonic infiltration, all demonic defilement, all demonic oppression. In the name of Jesus Christ, we claim total victory over all the power of the enemy at this, moment, at this hour. In Jesus' name. Father, we do away with every curse, every spell, every hex that is being cast upon the people that are gathered here tonight, this afternoon. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we will ask you to destroy whatever the enemy has done or has attempted to do against God's people that are gathered here in this campground for this camp meeting. We ask the Lord to open the way to victory and we open the way to freedom so that your people can leave, leave this place in such a spiritual condition that we can become mighty warriors, that we can become soldiers of Jesus Christ in this generation, yeah. that we will tear down the strongholds of the enemy throughout this land and throughout this world, and that the kingdom of God will be manifested in power and in glory through the intervention of your people, the elect, in these end times. We ask the Lord to, to help us experience that total victory that is available to us through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will not permit Satan to continue to devastate our lives, but that we will claim freedom so that we can be instruments in your hands to establish a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of peace in this world, that we can establish the kingdom of God so that Jesus Christ can reign supreme not only over the earth, but all over the entire universe. We thank you for everything that you've done we believe you for even greater things in the future. May Jesus Christ be honored. May he be glorified in our midst. May he be lifted up and draw all men to himself. We thank you and we praise you this afternoon in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.